Hi again, students. Welcome to the second part of the Chapter 13 lecture. Um, I just finished up with explaining how fossils were one line of evidence for evolution, um, and I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next um, line of evidence, which is biogeography. And this can be defined as the study of the geographic distribution of species. It first suggested to Darwin that today's organisms evolved from ancestral forms. So biogeography um, basically is the study of where organisms are in the world. And because you tend to see animals that um, look similar to one another or have the same um, life history strategies as one another in one place, it does suggest that those animals were not um, created for a specific environment, but rather evolved from a common ancestor and evolved the way they are um, due to similar environmental challenges. So Darwin noted that Galapagos animals resembled species of the South American mainland more so than they resembled animals on similar but distant islands. So he could imagine um, how animals and plants from the South American mainland colonized the Galapagos Islands and those ended up being founding populations of organisms for that island that took their own evolutionary path and thus were modified from the ancestors that came from the mainland. Um, another great example of biogeography would be the marsupials that are endemic to or only found on the Australian continent. Um, so there are a lot of marsupials in Australia and they are quite unique to that environment. Marsupials of course are mammals. They um, nourish their young with milk and they have hair in addition to being warm-blooded. But the difference between uh, marsupial mammals and placental mammals, which are the more common mammals that we think of on an everyday basis, such as cows, foxes, humans, etc., is that rather than nourishing their young for the full gestational period of time via placenta, marsupials give birth to altricial young, so underdeveloped young, that have to undergo the rest of their development outside of the womb. Um, so they give birth to what look like embryos. They're very underdeveloped without very strong limbs and of course they don't have strongly developed eyes when they emerge from the womb. Um, and those basically embryonic young have to make their way from the birth canal to the, the mother's pouch where they attach to a teat, which is of course a mammary gland and they attach to that teat and drink milk for the rest of the period of their um, development. So there are just two alternate strategies between placental mammals and marsupial mammals. So it's interesting to note that a lot of the same environmental niches or um, basically ecological roles are filled by marsupials as are filmed by filled by placental mammals on other continents. And another example of this is um, there are actually no rodents that are native to Australia. There are however um, small marsupial mammals that are very similar to rodents and that fill basically the same ecological niche. Comparative anatomy is another line of evidence for evolution, and it is the comparison of body structures between different species, and it attests that evolution is a remodeling process. So ancestral structures become modified through many generations as they take on new functions. So as the environment changes, and as certain characteristics become more advantageous than others, those ancestral structures become modified. Homology is a subcategory within comparative anatomy and is the similarity in structures strictly due to common ancestry. 
and it's illustrated by the remodeling of the pattern of bones that form the forelimbs of mammals for different functions. So we see this same pattern of bones in organisms as diverse as humans, cats, whales and porpoises, and bats. Not only do the ulna and radius, the carpal bones, and the meta metacarpal bones look similar, they actually have the same genetic basis. So we can examine the genes that are responsible for ultimately forming these structures within these species and find that they are homologous. Um, so again, this is an example of hom homology in structures, which is similarity in structures due to common ancestry. Vestigial structures can be thought of as another subcategory within comparative anatomy, and they are remnants of features that once served important functions in an organism's ancestors, and now have only marginal, if any, importance. So for example, modern day whales evolved from mammals that walked on land, and if you look through the fossil record, you'll see that older whales have um, stronger vestigial structures, so more um, more prominent hind limb bones within their flippers, and more modern whales have had more evolutionary time um, to develop away from those structures. So they have basically fewer bones that look like bones within land mammal legs. Early stages of development in different animal species reveal additional homologous relationships, and this leads to another line of evidence for evolution, which is comparative embryology. So as an example, pharyngeal pouches appear on the side of the embryo's throat, which develop into gill structures in fish and form parts of the ear and throat in humans. So this is the concept known as comparative embryology. Um, there's a lot of evidence within vertebrates, so animals with backbones, that supports evolutionary theory. And one example of this is you can look at embryos from very different species that might be in um, completely different taxa. So for example, mammals versus um, birds which are actually now classified with the reptiles, and you can see very similar structures. So for example, pharyngeal pouches, early on in embryonic development, they are quite prominent in humans, and they later form parts of the throat and ear. Those same structures are apparent in a chicken embryo, they're apparent in other mammalian embryos, as well as other um, reptilian embryos. We have the post-anal tail, so a tail that follows the anal region in these embryos. These structures, again, they're not only similar in appearance, but they actually share a molecular basis. So if you are to examine um, the sequence of genes between a chicken embryo and a human embryo, you're going to find that there is a genetic or molecular basis for those structures as well that is shared between chickens and humans. Molecular biology is another line of evidence that supports evolutionary theory, and it's the hereditary background of an organism which is documented in its DNA and the proteins encoded by the DNA. So this really gets back to all of the other lines of evidence for evolution. Uh, molecular biology is really at the core of all different um, subsets of biology. So molecular biology basically documents the evolutionary relationships among species, and it can be determined by comparing genes as well as proteins that are encoded by genes of different organisms. Here's an example of this. Um, we have several different species of primates. We have old world monkeys, gibbons, orangutans, and gorillas, which are both great apes, humans, and chimpanzees, which is another great ape. 
and we have the percent of selected DNA sequences that match a chimpanzee's DNA. So if we were to analyze the sequence, um, the sequences of different species within DNA, of course, a chimpanzee matches its own selected sequences 100%, but if we were to look at the similarity between a chimpanzee's DNA and our own DNA, we would have what amounts to an over 96% match. So our own um, genes differ from those of a chimpanzee's by just a few percentages. And of course, as we go further away from the great apes, we have less homology between our own genes and those of old world monkeys and gibbons, for example. Um, this is because evidence points to the fact that chimpanzees are our closest living relatives. That does not mean that we evolved from chimpanzees, but it does mean that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. <clears throat> so millions of years ago, we branched off from a common ancestor, and chimpanzees shared that same common ancestor but took a different evolutionary path. Darwin noted the close relationship between adaptation to the environment and the origin of new species. The evolution of finches on the Galapagos Islands is an excellent example. So we have several different species of finches. We have a large ground finch, a warbler finch, and a woodpecker finch, and they all share a common ancestor. However, they took different evolutionary paths, so certain subsects of the population of this common ancestor evolved into the large ground finch. Um, another subpart of the population evolved into the warbler finch, and another subset of the population evolved into the woodpecker finch. Whoops. So Darwin's theory of natural selection um, is based on two key observations. One that is that all species tend to produce excessive numbers of offspring. This is really apparent in species such as fishes that can produce thousands or even millions of eggs in their lifetime, as well as insects. And the organisms vary. That just means organisms differ from one another. And we're not just talking about differences between species, but we're talking about differences within species. Much of this variation is heritable meaning that it has a genetic basis and can be passed on from one generation to the next. Darwin's theory of natural selection continued. We have one observation that he wrote about, which is overproduction and competition. This means that all species have the potential to produce many more offspring than the environment can support and this leads to inevitable competition among individuals. So we tend to produce many more offspring than um, the land and its resources such as food, shelter, and water can really support. And what is the inevitable outcome of this excess of offspring? It's competition among those offspring. Um, his second observation was that individuals vary. So there's going to be variation within a population, so different individuals are going to have slightly differing traits, and much of that variation is heritable. So here we have some ladybird beetles. They're all the same species, but as you can see, their color differs, 